Thank you very much indeed, Charles. And can I say it really is a joy and delight to be back with you again this morning in uh, sunny Kilty. So glad to be here, so glad to see all of you. And one or two of you I don't think I've seen here before. The last time I was here was about October time last year. And it's a joy to see all of you. Hi, all the kiddies as well. Aren't they amazing? Mm -hmm. You just wish sometimes you could turn back the clock. <laughs> but alas, we can't quite do that as well, can we? But good to be here. Let's turn to God's Word, shall we, this morning to John's Gospel in chapter 16. John's Gospel in chapter 16. Let's go back and keep that wee one asleep. Little fellow, little girl? Boy. Little boy. Oh, okay. Time will tell. <laughs> All right. So John chapter 16, beginning there at verse number 12. I have much more to say to you, more than you can now bear. But when he, the spirit of truth, comes, he will guide you into all truth. He will not speak on his own. He will speak only what he hears, and he will tell you what is yet to come. He will bring glory to me by taking from what is mine and making it known to you. All that belongs to the Father is mine. That is why I said the Spirit will take from what is mine and make it known to you. In a little while, you will see me no more. And then after a little while, you will see me. Some of his disciples said to one another, what does Jesus mean by saying, in a little while you will see me no more, and then after a little while you will see me, and because I'm going to the Father. They kept asking, what does he mean by a little while? We don't understand what he is saying. Jesus saw what they wanted to ask him about this, so he said to them, Are you asking one another what I meant when I said, in a little while you will see me no more and then after a little while you will see me i tell you the truth you will weep and mourn while the world rejoices you will grieve but your grief will turn to joy a woman giving birth to a child has pain because her time has come but when her baby is born she forgets the anguish because of her joy that a child is born into the world. So with you. Now is your time of grief, but I will see you again and you will rejoice and no one will take away your joy. In that day, you will no longer ask me anything. I tell you the truth, my father will give you whatever you ask in my name. Until now, you have not asked for anything in my name. Ask, and you will receive, and your joy will be complete. Though I have been speaking figuratively, a time is coming when I will no longer use this kind of language, but will tell you plainly about my Father. In that day, you will ask in my name. I am not saying that I will ask the Father on your behalf, no. The Father himself loves you, because you have loved me, and have believed that I came from God. I came from the Father, and entered the world. Now I am leaving the world, and going back to the Father. Then Jesus' disciples said, Now you are speaking clearly, and without figures of speech. Now we can see that you know all things, and that you do not even need to have anyone ask you questions. This makes us believe that you came from God. You believe at last, Jesus answered. But a time is coming, and has come, when you will be scattered, each to his own home. You will leave me all alone, yet I am not alone, for my Father is with me. I have told you these things, so that in me you may have peace in this world, you will have trouble, but take heart. I have overcome the world. And there we finish. And we pray God's special blessing on his word again this morning. 
Now today, just for a little while to pick up that phrase on John 16, we want to share a few thoughts with you. <clears throat> Four great truths that we want to take on board. And here's the first one. The Spirit of God always shines the main beam on the Son of God. The Spirit of God always shines the main beam on the Son of God. And that's exactly what you have down there in verse 12 to verse 15. Now, if you take a look at verse 12, it shows to you and to me the nightmare that every preacher has when he stands before a congregation, not unlike what we have here in Kelty this morning. Did you see what the Bible actually says there? I have much more to say to you, more than you can now bear. The nightmare of every preacher. You know, it's the age old problem, isn't it? I think sometimes many of us who are preaching the word of God, we want to try and fill the quart bottle with maybe half a gallon of teaching. And you know, friends, quite frankly, you may try as you wish, it simply will not work. Mm -hmm. It just will not fit. You see, there's a limit. This preacher also needs to keep in the front of his mind. There is a limit to what people are able to take. And I think one of the lessons we learn from the story we have right here is that great teachers of God's word, they know when to stop talking. Now, that isn't only true for you and me who are preachers of the word and I, I, I hope I'm not tromping in anybody's toes today, but if I am, my apologies, uh, we're steel grippers next time around. But you see what you have right here? The Holy Spirit follows something very similar, doesn't it? The same pattern. When he ministers into your heart and into my life, he teaches us the truths that we need to know. And he does it exactly when we need to know them and when you and I are ready with God's help to receive them. I think maybe the telltale phrase we have down there is right in the middle of verse 13. See what it says there? He will not speak on his own. He will speak only what he hears. Now that's a precious and a powerful reminder that the Holy Spirit speaks into your life and mine only those thoughts that come to him direct from the mind of God. The counsellor is there to tell us what is very much on the heart of our Father. The counsellor is there to advise us what is very much on the mind of God. He is, as it were, the purveyor, the dispenser of God's truth. And so when the Holy Spirit speaks into your life and into mine, as I'm sure he will do day after day, and I trust that today will be no different. It's really an echo of the voice of God that we are privileged to be able to hear. And in so doing, two things happen. Number one, he will enlighten us with God's truth. And number two, he will enrich us with God's treasures. You see, my friends, when God speaks by his spirit, through his word, into your life and into mine, the bottom line is we are never quite the same again. And I think it's so important for us to realize even today that the work of the spirit of God is never ever divorced from the son of God or even the word of God. For example, we read down there in verse 14. He will bring glory to me by taking from what is mine and making it known to you. And this is so important, isn't it, when we talk about the work of the Holy Spirit. He will never, ever draw attention to himself. Never. The work of the Holy Spirit, his supreme role, is to shine the torchlight on Jesus Christ. He always glorifies the Son of God. He never ever diminishes the glory of Christ. He never ever, even for a fleeting moment, hogs the limelight or steals the spotlight for himself. Never. Do you know what that means today? It means the entire ministry of the Spirit of God is two things. Number one, 
It is God-centered. And number two, it is Jesus-focused. That is true for the Spirit of God. But you know, friends, how true that is in your life and mine. That is a powerful, useful lesson for you and for me to always take on board. And so the first thing we discover today, the Spirit of God always shines the main beam on the Son of God. But the second truth for you and I to buy into this morning is found in verse 16 down to verse 22. And it is this. Jesus turns the worst of times into the best of times. Mm -hmm. Did you get that? Mm -hmm. Jesus turns the worst of times into the best of times. You see, if you recall as I read it a few minutes ago, the rest of the chapter is one big long section where the focus is on experiencing joy. And the joy that we're talking about here in chapter 16 is a joy that is real. It's a joy that is bubbling up in your life and mine. Like the kids were singing, our cup is full and it's running over. It's a joy that is abundant in spite of all that is happening around us. Look at the narrative in John 16 and the surrounding chapters. These guys quite literally find themselves in the pits of despair. To put it very simply, these fellas, they're feeling very much under the weather. And I would imagine the last thing in any one of their minds is certainly being joyful. These guys don't feel it. They certainly don't show it. And I suppose if they're being honest, some of them probably didn't even want it. But that's how bad they were. They had plummeted, they had sunk to an all-time low. But the bottom line is, these men we read off in this little section, they're human, flesh and blood, just like you, just like me. And that's the mega challenge the Lord Jesus deals with right here in these verses. How to turn the worst of times into the best of times. Do you see what he draws right here? He shows to you and to me how we can live above our circumstances. Even in your life and mine, when things seem to have disintegrated into a million broken pieces, and for you and me, maybe even gathered here this morning, it is nothing more than shattered dreams. Do you know what he does? He shows to every single one of us how we can experience a profound depth of joy in each of our hearts. Okay, we may not be happy, and that's all right because happiness depends on what happens to us. We may not be happy, but Jesus says it right here. And Paul picks up that wonderful theme in Philippians 4. We may not be happy, but we can be joyful. And that's the way it is when we're following Jesus, isn't it? That's the way it is in the Christian life. And my friend, the won't go away fact this morning is this, that your God and mine can take a seemingly impossible situation. He can add to that the miracle of his grace. And you know what he can do? He can transform the trial we're in right now. And they can turn it into a triumph. You read the narrative of Scripture and you will discover this, that our God specializes in turning situations around. Mm -hmm. And when he does, it is always for the best. Let me give you one or two illustrations that have culled from the pages of God's Word. The obvious one, Joseph. Remember what his older brothers did to him? You know, these guys, they thought they could make a quick shekel or two. So what did they do? They sold him as a slave. Potiphar kicked him into prison as a common criminal. But what did God do? Well, God did what he does best, and his track record is impeccable. He transformed a dire situation of defeat into one of glorious victory. You meant it for evil, even Joseph could say. But God, he meant it for good. Here's another one. 
Egypt's ruthless persecution of the people of Israel only caused them to get what? Bigger and better. So true, isn't it? But let me give you a final one. <clears throat> Even the Lord Jesus, he took the cross, a symbol of abject defeat, a symbol of unthinkably horrendous shame. And what did he do? They sang about it a minute ago, didn't they? He transformed it into an emblem of victory and glory. You know, in the context of what we have right here in John 16, I think it's always tough when we have to say farewell to a loved one, isn't it? Sometimes it's, it's unplanned. More often than not, it's unscheduled. But you know, friends, when it comes around in your life and in mine, and when it's your time to do it, I can tell you this, it's never as easy as the professionals make it out to be. That's the issue, isn't it? And that's what Jesus is talking about right here. Jesus has tipped these guys off on numerous occasions that he's about to go. Hence the phrase, in a little while. But the reality is, these guys in the upper room in Jerusalem, to a man, they're struggling to come to terms with it. But the pain they feel is perfectly understandable, isn't it? And that's why Jesus takes the bull by the horns, as we sometimes say. That's why Jesus goes out of his way to breathe new hope into hearts that are desperately troubled. That's why Jesus said to these fellows, you will grieve, but your grief will turn to joy. You know, Jesus is the first to acknowledge their feelings of bereavement. He's the first to empathize with them with their sense of profound loss. But in the very next breath, he reminds them, look guys, it won't always be like that. You've got to pick yourself up, dust yourself down, as it were, and then move on. You see, the fact that Jesus is going away isn't the end of the world. No, no. It's simply the start of a brand new era. It is the opening of another new chapter. It's a launch pad for these people to be thrust into a whole new dimension of ministry. It will be the first day of the rest of their lives. And that's when Jesus shared with them a story. A story with a very human touch to it. Isn't it? You see what we read about there in verse 21, and I can see the young lady with a little one in front of me this morning. You know, we read in verse 21 about a woman giving birth to a child. Sure, they tell me, she has her moments. She maybe wonders, is it worth all the pain, and the agony? But when the little one is born, gives a cry, all of that is swiftly brushed aside. I mean, you talk to any first-time mum, and more often than not, they tell you exactly the same thing that Jesus says right here. I mean, it's amazing, isn't it? True? How quickly the labour pain is forgotten. You see, you see what's happening? She has passed from deep sorrow into elation and pure joy. She's got a healthy, bouncing baby in her arms, and that's all that matters. But the punchline comes, doesn't it? Look the punchline down there in verse 22. When Jesus applied that warm truth to each of their hearts, he said to these people, so it is with you. Now is your time of grief, but I will see you again and you will rejoice and no one will take away your joy. You know, friends, even there, the Lord displays this uncanny ability of being able to take the worst of times and do what? Turn them into the best of times. He's the only one I know, the only one I know, who can turn something upside down, who can turn something inside out. Do you know? It's always better than it was before. But that's Jesus. That's God. 
And the joy that Jesus promised right here is a, is a full joy. Uh, there's no half measures. It's complete. There's nothing lacking. It's about you and I being able to look, as it were, on the sunnier side of life. And I think one of the lessons we all need to take on board here is simply this. Whatever the turmoil in your life or mine right now, we can look on the bright side. Your circumstances may stay exactly the same, sure. Your situation, it may remain static. But you know what the difference is? It's in your heart. It's in your mind. It's in your life. We are buoyant when all is sinking around us. Because Jesus can turn the worst of times into the best of times. Well, so far we've taken a look at verse 16 down to verse 22, where Jesus will turn our sorrow into joy. Now, see what he does for number three in verses 23 to 28. Here's the third main point, and it's basically in prayer. We take it to Jesus, and we talk it over with Jesus. Do you get that? We take it to Jesus, and we talk it over with Jesus. And my friends, here's something you and I can sink our teeth into, isn't it? Here is something to keep every one of us going, even when, as the wee song tells us, the going is rough and steep. It's the fact that we can talk it over with Jesus. And hey, don't we know from experience, don't we, that God hears our prayers and that God answers our prayers. I have to say I like the way he does it down here, for example, in verses 25 and 26. You see what he does? Jesus clarifies the matter of our access to Father God. <clears throat> now, for these disciples at this point, this was what we would call a real hot potato. You see, up to this point in the story, in each of their lives, Jesus was with them pretty much all day, every day, 24-7. I mean, anything they needed, he was right there. They simply had to ask him. And that was it. Plain sailing. Ah, and now he's going. And these guys are wondering, is there a plan B? You see, that was the problem they faced, wasn't it? It's a problem too big for them to handle. Too big for them. But it wasn't too difficult for the Lord. You see what Jesus does here in this little paragraph? He tells them they were in a win-win situation. Did you notice that? When he is with them in the body, in the flesh, all was fine. It was hunky-dory. But when he wasn't there, and when he wouldn't be with them in the body, in the flesh, you see what? They would have a hotline of direct access to the Father in heaven. Amazing. You see, either way, they don't miss out. They don't even lose out. And my friend, for you and me here today, so far as we are concerned, just like them, by simple childlike faith, we have unlimited access into the presence of our Heavenly Father. I mean, I'm telling you stuff you already know, but it's good to be reminded, isn't it? He's on call, yeah, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And do you know something? No matter how many people around the world are bending his ear, listen to this, his line is never, ever engaged. Never. But that's what prayer, that's what communion is all about. Thank God today the Father doesn't turn a blind eye to your needs and to mine. No, no. The Father doesn't lend a deaf ear to your request. No, no. Do you know something? Two things. Number one, he's on your side. Yeah. And number two, he has your back. He has your back. So the third lesson we learned today is that we take it to Jesus and then we talk it over with Jesus. 
And the final lesson is simply this in verse 29 to 33, those last uh, couple of paragraphs. In tough times, we are still on the winning team. Amen. In tough times, we're still on the winning team. You know, any motorist will tell you that uh, blind spots on the road are a real hazard, aren't they? I mean, they test your skill. They certainly test your nerve. Now, that's not only true if you're driving up the M8 or whatever the road might be. That's also true in a spiritual sense. Because right there in verse 29 and 30, the disciples have come a long way. Oh, yes. But there's still a few blind spots in their faith. You see, at this point in their lives, there's that grey area in their realm of faith. There's a big, big chunk, as it were, of their spiritual understanding that is seriously blurred. But you know, given time, the gaps would all get plugged. And the pieces would fall neatly into place. And that has to be said. It's not the kind of thing that's going to happen overnight. For some of these guys in the upper room, it would take a few hours, a few days. For some of them, it's going to take a bit longer, a few months. But the fact of the matter is this for every one of us here today, just like them. Faith is a growing experience, isn't it? It's a deepening of that special, unique relationship we share with the Lord. My friend, there's no point in you and I putting pressure on ourselves. No point in it. Better for you and I to live with the fact that day after day, our faith is being stretched as we get to know God better. They call it maturity. That's what it's called. And one of the prime ways the muscle of faith becomes stronger is when it is tested. And that's what Jesus is talking about down there in verse 32 when he warned them yet another time of his impending departure. Because that's a moment when their faith would really be tested. When he was gone, they couldn't run to him because he wouldn't be there. And so the question is, how would they cope with being thrown into the water at the deep end? I mean, would they sink or would they swim? I love this about Jesus because down there in verse 33, he doesn't dodge the hard issues when he has a conversation with his disciples. See what he does at the end of the chapter? He talked about the hostility they would face in the world in which they were living. He speaks about the insult and the abuse that people would hurl in their direction. It's a possibility of misunderstandings and even misrepresentation. You've got all the nasty, obnoxious things that Joe Public can do and often say, and all of that is packaged in that little word, trouble. Trouble or tribulation. But you know, friends, the good news today even is this, that even when we find ourselves enveloped in such times, do you know what? They can still experience, as can we, his peace, his shalom in their hearts. Why? Because Jesus has overcome the world. That's why. He is their mainstay. He is their anchor. He is their one and only source of strength and of courage. These guys, irrespective of what the future looked like, irrespective of what was going on right now. Mm. They could face the future with confidence because their eyes are focused on a God who reigns victorious, on a God whose kingdom is glorious, on a God whose power is unrivaled. My friends, here is a God who is second to none and is yours and mine. And that's why Jesus told these fellows, he said, look guys, take heart, take heart. You know, it wasn't the first time he told them that, was it? You know what the phrase really means? He says, cheer up, 
Cheer up. Come on, guys. Cheer up. Matthew 9, the good cheer of his pardon. Matthew 9, 18, 22, the good cheer of his power. Matthew 14, the good cheer of his presence. Oh, preacher, guys, there are three Ps there for you. But here's another one. I'm going to pee for it, though. The good cheer of his victory over the world. He says, I have done it. I have overcome. Cheer up. Take heart. You see what I mean, dear friends? For you and for me, when our back is again that wall, there's really no need for us to have that defeatist mentality. Sure, I'm the first to acknowledge it's hard going. I know it's hard going. It's tough, and I know it's tough. But you and I are on the winning team. We are on the victory side. And I didn't say that. Jesus said that. Let's pray. Father, we say thank you again this morning for the privilege of being able to gather just like this. Thank you for everyone who's taken the time and made the effort to meet with each other and with yourself here in the house of God. Thank you for every little boy and little girl being taught now the ways of truth. And Father, thank you again for the hymns that we have sung and heard sung. Thank you, Father, again for your precious word. Oh, Father, really, it's a lamp to our feet. It's undoubtedly a light to our path. We pray, Father, for everyone gathered here, that whatever the need may be, may we take heart, may we cheer up, May we realise and recognise, maybe even for the very first time, that yes, you can turn the worst of times into the best of times. Mm -hmm. Father, we cast ourselves upon you, a sovereign Lord. Pray that you will take each of our hearts and lives. Pray that you will mould us into the image of Jesus Christ. And grant like the Holy Spirit himself, may we be attracted to him and may others see him in each of our hearts fathers we continue to fellowship with one another may these moments be wonderfully blessed a glimpse of heaven itself mm. then as we leave in a little while grant that we might know the fullness of the blessing of the gospel of christ and until we meet again may the grace of the lord jesus may the love of god May the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be our abiding portion. For his sake we ask it. Amen. 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 Amen.